well and now serves as Minister of Climate Change and Environment uh, for Norway. And any of you who watch the PBS NewsHour, which is my favorite news show to watch, this is not free advertising for PBS, recently saw him on a really great uh, piece they had about electric vehicles in Norway. Uh, and, uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So without further ado, Minister Helgeson. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to uh, have the opportunity to uh, address a topic which is uh, close to my heart, but also very close to uh, the international agenda, particularly this week. And uh, I'm uh, intrigued by the fact that uh, you planned on this uh, <laughs> seminar series, um, just as uh, there is a crucial moment in the uh, discussions globally on uh, climate change. Since uh, it's about climate change and the national interest, my starting point will be that Norway is an Arctic uh, nation. Concentration of uh, nuclear arms in Europe, the Kola Peninsula. Uh, to us, for example, that means that NATO matters a great deal. Most of our territory is in the Arctic, uh, if you include the oceans, that is. Oceans make Norway seven times, about seven times as big as uh, our land territory, and it's an ocean rich on resources, uh, oil and gas, fish and seafood. We have a strong maritime industry. This means that the law of the sea matters a great deal to Norway. We're a major exporter of that fish and seafood. Um, I think we're exporting some 39 million meals of salmon each day. That means trade deals matter a great deal to Norway. And speaking of the Arctic, it's currently warming at uh, twice the speed as the global average. And that means that the Paris Agreement matter, matters a great deal to Norway. So the high north, from many perspectives, is a core national interest. It's our prime foreign policy uh, priority. And we see international collaboration in all these domains as critical to safeguard our interests. Rapid climate change is affecting ecosystems in the Arctic as we speak. Um, it also leads to more economic activity, um, oil and gas, marine resources, maritime activity, space activity. These are things that also will impact security in the region. And when Arctic climate, is, climate change is accelerating, this is uh, um, creating more potential unpredictability about uh, the future of the region but it also has significant global um, repercussions. Uh, Arctic climate change is accelerating also because of two very important uh, dynamics. As Arctic sea ice and snow cover retracts, uh, this weakens surface reflectivity. Ice is replaced by bare ground uh, and open water, which absorb more heat from the sun and amplify warming further. And this feedback is an important reason why the Arctic warms at twice the rate now of the global average. Secondly, the Arctic permafrost is a storehouse for trapped uh, greenhouse gases, such as methane and CO2. And when that permafrost is thawing, which is currently, it's currently doing, uh, these greenhouse gases could be released to the atmosphere, amplifying global warming further. So these are some of the immediate issues we're grappling with and watching almost on a daily basis happening in the uh, Arctic. And these secondary effects add to the unpredictable nature of climate change, both in terms of consequences and in terms of the unpredictability of the pace of, of climate change. And as we know, unpredictability means enhanced uh, risks. And recent research indicates that um, this is the case, the, the risk picture is not only a matter for the Arctic, but uh, that Arctic climate change is also affecting regions very far away. Uh, this is due to the global climate system, uh, which is highly interconnected on the global scale. The Arctic region acts like a global cooling system. It's drawing warm ocean wa water from the south and it's cooling it down. And this movement of warmer ocean waters to the north has a major influence on climate also outside the Arctic. It accounts for the relatively mild temperature in Northern Europe 
and it does keep the tropics cooler than they would otherwise be. Now, the rapid melting of Arctic ice and snow is likely to weaken this global cooling system, amplifying global warming, intensifying consequences uh, throughout the world. There are several studies that have linked the loss of sea ice uh, and snow cover in the Arctic to changes in Northern Hemisphere storm tracks, floods, and winter weather patterns. There's also evidence that Arctic changes may be influencing even the Southeast Asian monsoons. And a recent study is showing disturbing potential consequences for maize and wheat yields across the Northern Hemisphere. On wheat production, for example, while China would probably gain our largest neighboring country, Russia, would lose dramatically. Now, these are still early data. These are still, uh, there's still uncertainty. But uh, again, unpredictability is an issue. And needless to say, food security is not only about the security of food. It's also about the security of uh, nations. And these prospects grow on you when you consider that most of uh, the Earth's environmental and natural resource systems are under high pressure already. According to the UN, half of the world's uh, population will face water shortages by 2035. And more than 30 countries, uh, nearly half of them in the Middle East, are likely to experience extremely high water stress by 2035. And when you consider that the Arab Spring was preceded by crop failures in Russia and Ukraine, driving up the price of wheat and causing social unrest. And when you consider that drought and crop failure led a million and a half Syrians into uh, the urban centers preceding the revolt there, we uh, are looking at uh, potential security issues surrounding uh, Europe that are severe and that we've seen some uh, um, precedents for in the recent years. Uh, we do know that we can expect climate uh, change to exacerbate current conditions, meaning that hot and dry places will become hotter and drier. If the world fails on climate change and temperatures rise beyond the two degree uh, target of the Paris Agreement, if we're talking three, four, five degrees, large parts of the Middle East will effectively be uninhabitable. And since we're talking about regions surrounding Europe with a number of fragile states, when they fail or collapse, climate change can act as a risk uh, multiplier, whether we talk of uh, civil wars or of terrorism. There's a recent report uh, commissioned by the German Forest Foreign Office uh, that uh, documents that terrorist groups are using control of natural resources, such as water, as a weapon of war. Uh, the scarcer resources become, the more power is given to those who control them. Uh, examples included in this report are IS and Boko Haram. So we're facing security challenges in Europe's neighborhood that are likely to be exacerbated by uh, climate change. Europe today is facing unpredictability and instability to the east and to the south. Then we're facing unpredictable climate changes uh, in the north. And the remaining direction to the west, that's where we're traditionally used to uh, looking for predictability and steadfast global leadership. <laughs> Facing these challenges, we need a framework for shared action. And the Paris Agreement offers just that. Paris adds some predictability to the uncertainties of climate change. And this is important because our climate is not the only thing that is changing. We're seeing economic, technological, and demographic changes that are adding to potential solutions to climate change, but also adding potential risks. Uh, the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, has pointed to climate change as a risk to financial stability. Evidently, he's talking of physical risks resulting from uh, extreme weather events that can damage property and disrupt trade. He's also pointing to liability risks, um, such as, action, as actions taken against companies for failing to disclose climate risk. And he's talking about transition risks, which could result from the transition to a low carbon economy, including sudden changes in policy uh, resulting from uh, dramatic uh, climate events. 
And then there are technology-induced risks. Um, combating climate change will require faster technological change. And indeed, technology is accelerating the pace of change around us and in the process triggering new complex challenges and disruptions and tensions. We're already seeing how globalization of markets and technological changes have caused political disruption. They're likely to continue to cause political uh, disruption. But the Paris Agreement in all this sets an ambition and a direction for the world that is critical if we are to successfully navigate climate change, technological change, and economic changes that uh, are upon us. And I think we um, uh, therefore need as an international community to uh, focus even more on how we live up to that ambition of the uh, Paris Agreement. We know that some degree of climate change is unavoidable. Uh, and that's why we also need to prevent uh, that unavoidable climate change from undermining security in the shorter term. Uh, as climate change does increase security risks and unpredictability in fragile states and regions, we need to respond to these. And for Europeans, these regions are close to home and uh, that's why in a recent white paper on uh, Norwegian foreign and security policy we have pledged to undertake a further study of the relationship between climate change and security. We have said we will step up uh, aid and stabilization efforts in Europe's neighborhood and we've also concluded that Norway needs to develop closer security policy cooperation with European allies and the other Nordic countries. Let me move on to um, the economic and business case for climate action. National interest, after all, is not only about security, it's also about uh, economy. Norway is a major oil and gas producer and exporter, and some express surprise that as such we're also an advocate of ambitious climate policies. But climate action makes economic sense. We know, even under the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, estimates that oil and gas will be with us for a long time uh, under a two degree scenario. We don't know exactly for how long, but we also know that oil and gas will no longer be the engine of economic growth for my country. And that's why we need to build and invest in uh, building green competitiveness. Uh, the G20 commissioned a recent OECD study that shows that combining economic reforms with ambitious climate policies will have a positive impact on GDP. Their estimate is that if we implement the policies necessary to achieve the two degree um, centigrade target under Paris, this will in fact have a net 4.6% positive impact on GDP across the G20. On the other hand, putting off the transition will be costly. Again, their estimate is that if we don't implement the necessary climate uh, policies, uh, the G20 may face GDP losses of 2% on average after 10 years. Now that's more than the growth number in many OECD countries uh, today. And losses would be higher, they say, for net fossil fuel exporting countries. And so Norway needs to invest in building a greener economy. We have determined that we will be a low emission society by 2050. Last week, government passed our proposal for a climate change act where we are actually enshrining into law that target uh, with a number. We're uh, stating that we'll reduce emissions by 80 to 95% by 2050. And we're acting on that uh, both by cutting emissions but also by transforming the economy. Two years back, uh, we established a committee on green competitiveness. It's the world's smallest committee, consisting of two persons one prominent financial sector CEO and a former Danish EU Commissioner for Climate Change. We tasked them with drawing up a report to advise the government on three things. How can we cut emissions, create growth and create jobs? And they, then they went ahead um, not only writing a report but challenging business sectors in Norway to think through their own pathways to the low emission society in 2050. And wow, did they respond. We by now have around 15 business sectors that have drawn up their own roadmaps to 2050, to the low emission society. They pledged to create more value while, while essentially becoming emission free by 2050. And that means as a government we're now 
uh, in partnership with business, we have a set of plans from key actors in most economic sectors on how to get there. There's a long way from having those plans to implementing them, but the dynamics that have been unleashed are very interesting, because I think that's what happens when you ask business. They know their business, they know markets, they know technological trends, and that's the same across the world. I was heartened to see today that uh, 1,200 US companies are now joining the We Are Still In campaign in this country, and I think you'll see that uh, across the world, businesses looking at opportunities in uh, the transformation to the low carbon society. Uh, there's a saying that the Stone Age didn't end because of shortage of stones. Neither did cars become a major mode of transportation because of a shortage of horses. And today, I think the transition to low carbon solutions is driven not primarily by political actions, but by uh, technology and markets. If you tend to believe that uh, the Paris Agreement is a conspiracy against the US. I think you must think that technology has launched an all-out war on this country because uh, a technological revolution is happening in energy, a technological revolution is happening in transportation, and we're seeing that the low emission technologies are accelerated by technological changes that would come regardless of climate change, such as uh, digitalization, robotics, automation. And I believe there's a lot politics can achieve but uh, it will never be able to stop technology. Politicians are able to stimulate or destroy an economy, but they're absolutely not able to stop technology. But what politics can do about technology is to incentivize adaptation to te te technological change and incentivize the right use of technology. And through the near universal participation, the Paris Agreement is expanding markets for innovative clean technologies generating jobs and economic growth. And the economic opportunities from the low carbon economy are immense. Yes, there will be costs along the way. Yes, there will be businesses that are not future oriented and that will decline and ultimately end. But uh, there are great opportunities as well. Economy wide investments in clean energy could save $370 billion per year by 2030 in reduced fuel, uh, fuel costs. According to the Business and Sustainable Development Commission that put out its report earlier this year, globally, companies could unlock $12 trillion in worldwide revenue and savings by pursuing sustainable business models with the potential to create up to 380 million jobs by 2030. And globally, clean energy investments to meet the Paris Agreement goals could add $19 trillion to global GDP by 2050. We don't want, as a government, to be left behind in that development. And we believe that by investing in new solutions early, our industries and businesses can be winners on low emission markets. And I'm not only talking here about green tech startups. I'm also talking about our major oil and gas company, Statoil. They're making now big investments in renewables, uh, pledging, for example, that one third of their research and development budget by 2030 will be directed towards renewable technologies. Their deep water uh, expertise is currently being put to use in the major offshore wind project outside New York. And we see many of the other suppliers to oil and gas industries finding new and greener opportunities for their uh, technologies. And I'm going to end with an observation on this, because I'm often asked again, how can we promote ambitious climate policies while being still uh, a major oil and gas producing nation? And my response is that being an oil and gas producing nation is a reality that we will not try to hide and not try to escape. Oil has served Norway well and will uh, serve and is serving uh, Norway well. Demand for oil will continue for how will determine for how long that will continue. It will determine the future of oil. There's actually no country doing more, probably today, to uh, electrify transport than Norway is, and that's the most important sector for driving down demand for oil, so that's another, another paradox of uh, Norway. We know the future will bring changes, but we will be much more likely to succeed if the technological, financial and human resources of our oil and gas sector and related industries are part of that transformation. And the fact that they are uh, bodes well for the industry and it's a good sign for Norway's transformation to a low carbon society and I hope and believe it could serve as an inspiration for others as well.
Thank you very much. It is core and, and grounded in how a, uh, a citizenry thinks about an issue, right? What is in their interest? So I want to start with a very basic question, which is, how do you think the Norwegian public thinks about climate change? What's foremost in their mind? What do they have trouble with? What, what is, if you asked you know, the Norwegian public, what do they think about climate change? Extreme weather is what they will think about. Uh -huh. Now, some would say Norway has had extreme weather I always. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, um, we're seeing uh, changes happening. We have more floods. We have uh, more heavy rain, uh, more landslides, practical effects. Now, not all people all the time would relate that to climate change, but mm -hmm. in the public debate, it's. Uh, it's starting to take hold. And then in the Arctic, uh, we're seeing, as I mentioned, rapid climate change, which in the form of retreating glaciers, in the form of changing ecosystems, you have Atlantic cod that you can now fish in the Arctic. You shouldn't have Atlantic cod, you should have Arctic cod in the Arctic. Um, so you see a number of concrete examples that climate change is happening. Mm -hmm. Now still for many people, climate policy is vague, it's hard to understand and hard to grasp. Uh, but there's a broad consensus um, that we should pursue an ambitious climate policy. And there's a fairly fierce debate on uh, what I mentioned here, our position as an oil and gas exporter and a producer and uh, being an ambitious country on climate change. I wanna pull, uh, actually ask you a little bit more about that because I think if you were to ask most people around the world uh, you know, characterize Norway when it comes to energy and environment. They would say that you're a leader on a lot of international environmental issues like climate change, and we talk a little bit about ways in which you've played that role, um, but that you're also a, a major oil and gas producer. And, and the experience has been that, it, especially here in the United States and in other countries where that's the experience, there is a tension there. There is a tension between those two existences. And um, you, you talked about it a little bit, but over the, period of time that you've been dealing with this issue, do you see that, that, that tension between sort of the fossil-based energy resource industry in Norway and that being sort of core uh, to, uh, to the economic interests in Norway sh shifting to more of an acceptance of this new competitive reality of, of green technology? Or is that tension still there? Are there still members of society or communities that have a hard time with uh, making that transition? No, I mean, if, you, uh, if your underlying question here is, do we have anything like the uh, coal romanticism in Norway? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. it's, there's, uh, uh, people are realizing that the transformation is taking place. Uh, the debate is sort of how long will the transformation last? My response to that is demand will determine. And we need to drive down demand for fossil fuels. Um, Given that there's been this the, the fall of uh, the, the slumping oil price over the recent years, we've seen also less young people applying for um, universities that will lead them into the uh, oil and gas sector. Um, it remains to be seen whether that will be more of a permanent trend uh, mm -hmm. given the overall uh, transformation picture. Um, but we, um, yeah, we have a discussion on how long. I, th I think the major discussion is really, uh, given that oil and gas investments have a long time perspective, mm -hmm. the real discussion is what is the investment risk? Uh, what would be profits 20, 30, 40 years down the line? Would those um, profits be high enough to defend or justify the investments made today. Mm -hmm. That's the most looming discussion, and there you'll find clear disagreements. Mm -hmm. One of the, sort of staying with the policy realm for a minute, one of the things we have a, a hard time with here in the US is getting anything that remotely approximates a carbon tax passed or a price on carbon. And we do have 
um, places in the country where there are uh, prices on carbon, and most of industry in the energy sector has an in sort of a shadow price that they use for planning purposes. Um, but one of the things I found interesting is that Norway, I mean, clearly has had a price on carbon for a long period of time, and so that's something that wasn't as, as big of a hurdle, I guess, uh, um, for you. But now you've sort of doubled down on a, on a pretty ambitious goal, which is to, you know, carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, and, uh, and you mentioned you've got about 15 sector strategies that have been put in place or proposed to do that. Can you tell us a little bit about those strategies? I mean, were there sectors of the economy where it was much more difficult for them to come up with a, a strategy than others, and uh, others that, that had an easier time? Uh, well, certainly uh, oil and gas, uh, if you look at 2050, um, it's hard to predict what the future will be like. And I think they've had uh, some challenges uh, as an industry to uh, draw up that strategy. Now Statoil as the main actor in that landscape has made its own strategy, its own priorities and plans that are fairly concrete. Their CEO is saying there will be peak demand for oil before 2030. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a company we have to adapt to that. Uh, and that's why they're making these investments in um, new energy solutions as they call them. And they stopped calling themselves a petroleum company, they call themselves an energy company. Uh, but I think that's a sector where, where it's been hard uh, to make that uh, strategy. And uh, it's, I mean, if you, if you look at being carbon neutral by 2050, that would depend on carbon capture and storage, mm -hmm. uh, as would it for uh, our process um, industry, which uh, is a major emitter. But these industries are covered by a carbon tax, but they're also part of the European emission trading scheme. So they have a sort of double taxation. Uh, imposed on them. Uh, then transportation is the biggest uh, outside the uh, emission trading scheme in Europe. We, transportation is our biggest challenge, uh, but it's also where we're making a lot of headway with electrification. Yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I did mention this great piece that was, uh, and a lot of people realize that Norway has a lot of electric vehicles, but highest number of electric vehicles per capita in the world. Um, and some pretty interesting policies to not only get you to that goal, but try and get beyond that. Could you talk a little bit about what you're doing in that space? Yeah, we've had for, for quite a long time, we've had uh, exemption from registration tax, which is high for cars in Norway, <laughs> and <laughs> exemption from VAT, which is also high, 25% <laughs> in Norway, uh, which essentially means that if you buy a Tesla in Norway, it would be less than half the market price. So that's why Elon really? Musk uh, looks at Norway <laughs> vacations in with Norway. Uh, <laughs> amazement. Um, now, for a long time, that didn't really have a fiscal impact because there were so few cars sold. Now we've, we're seeing an explosion, uh, not only because of Teslas, but because you have other models coming onto the market that are more reasonably priced. And, uh, and even uh, now with um, battery capacity that makes them a viable alternative. Uh, so last year, I think Norway, we have one thousandth of the global population, but we had 6% of global electric vehicle sales. Uh, in Norway, 17%, I think, of cars sold this year are electric. Uh, if you add hybrid cars, it's one third. And we've set a target of, by 2025, that there should be no new fossil fuel cars sold. When we set that target a uh, year back, it was seen as uh, sort of another one of those lofty political goals, uh, but our equivalent to the EPA has actually later determined that uh, if you keep pursuing the same policies as today, it is achievable to get there. Huh? Uh, to, to get there. Now the bigger challenge is heavy duty vehicles yeah. uh, and of course aviation, mm -hmm. but we're, uh, our aviation authority has recently said that they would like to see Norway, which is a long country, but with a lot of short distance uh, flight routes uh, to see us as a test bed for electric flights around 2030, which uh, Airbus and Siemens are saying is realistic. There will be electric planes on the market by, by 2030. Well, that's very exciting. Um, if you're anxious about uh, the reach of batteries when you drive a car, imagine <laughs> yeah, yeah. on an airplane. It's a, whole, a whole new sense of the word range anxiety, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think I. Are there, I mean, 
I think one of the interesting things in the U.S. is that there are a lot of first adopter issues associated with electric vehicles. Did you experience that in Norway, right? Where, where there are issues like range anxiety. Norway is not always just a sunny sort of rainy place, right? You have some pretty serious weather. And it, were, did, were there those sort of social acceptance issues as well associated with the policy? Um, I mean, there, were, there, there has been testing and uh, failure. We even tried to produce electric vehicles uh, some years back, and that failed massively. Um, but as I mean, the policy has been in place for, I think, uh, well, 15 years. Yeah. Uh, but it's really in the recent years that it's taken off as technology has, has matured. Mm -hmm. And of course, in parallel with those incentives, which also, by the way, uh, includes free parking, access to public transport lanes. Uh, no tolls, right? Yeah. No toll roads uh, payments. So um, um, as that has, um, I mean, it, it's, it's such uh, a benefit for people to drive electric vehicles that that's been seen as uh, almost only providing upsides. Yeah. Now, yeah. as it has a fiscal impact, there is more discussion about that, but nothing threatening that policy. Yeah. But alongside that, we've also had um, an investment in building infrastructure. I mean, you need charging facilities and charging stations across the country. Mm -hmm. We'll complete that by the end of this year uh, for all main state highways in Norway. And there's more and more private initiative and regional initiatives on that too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So turning a minute away from sort of domestic politics in Norway and policy in Norway to the role that you play internationally. I think that one of the things that has always characterized Norway's position in international climate talks is the, the sort of forward leaning position you take on a, a lot of different issues. I was interested in today that the fact that you led with security issues uh, and you led with the, the, the concept of climate security, which is sometimes an, a niche issue here, even though it really gets to the core of why we care about climate change in the first place. Um, why is that? Why is that come uh, as as an area of, of core national interest for Norway that you've decided to, to do the special study on and, and and pick out as something to focus on? Well, only two years back, the big issue, not only in Norway but in Europe, was the refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, we had um, systems that even in very robust societies like uh, Norway and Sweden and Germany were overwhelmed by the influx of uh, refugees. Um, and the instability and fragility of uh, the Middle East and North Africa region um, is therefore of high concern to us. Uh, the refugee flow is continuing, it's been managed better, but uh, new crises uh, and we know that one of the regions that will be hardest hit by climate change is exactly the Middle East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. More drought, less food production there will have a direct impact on us. And I think that's, it's more existential to Europe than it is to the US. We, yeah. Yeah. we have a Mediterranean Ocean, but it's barely possible. We don't have a, an Atlantic Ocean between us and that challenge. Um, and then when you look at instability to the east, um, uh, food production in Russia and the Ukraine uh, is also critical, not only to those countries, but also to uh, the global food market. Um, so the link between climate change and food security and humanitarian consequences and very real political consequences in Europe um, is quite evident. Yeah, uh, and yeah. we, it's not only a theory for us, we've seen it in practice. Well, and, and it does seem as though in the last several years, having the experience of a migration crisis that is much smaller than what would be projected for a lot of sort of you well within conservative climate bounds, showed how quickly government systems can be stressed by that. And it, what, what is interesting is it helps, it helps understand that, that climate policy and climate action isn't always just a cost, right? We always sort of focus on the near-term cost, but it is a cost for a, a a sort of uh, avoided benefit or avoided harm down the road. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is another thing uh, that we tend to hear quite a bit about is the politics of how uh, Norway uses its sovereign wealth fund and how climate change and those issues. Uh, 
it, it does give uh, a signal, an outsized signal uh, for Norway in terms of the, the signal you give to investors about how they think about responsible investing and climate change, and you are always sort of at the forefront of that. Can you talk about uh, where that debate is right now? Well, first and foremost, I'd like to underline that um, our sovereign wealth fund is not a political tool. We have um, established politically some basic principles. We'd like it to be profitable because that's a duty to uh, future generations. It's a way of spending our oil wealth uh, well and wisely. Uh, but we've also set us, uh, established a set of ethical criteria, uh, again, politically, for the fund. And within those, the fund is managing this professionally, and we don't have individual political interventions. Uh, it has caused, uh, in the past, some uh, political discussions, including with the, US, with the US, when they pulled out of Walmart, for example. There was no politics in that from the side of Norway. But um, um, the latest political move we've made is um, to determine that um, uh, they should consider pulling out of companies with more than a 30% uh, of the portfolio invested in coal, mm -hmm. uh, or more than 30% of operations dependent on coal. Uh, that has led the fund to do just that. I mean, they're on an ongoing basis monitoring their uh, portfolio to um, pull out of, of coal. Um, it wasn't a given that we would end up giving that or making that decision because we are mindful of the fund being a professional actor and not wanting to project it as, as a political tool. But um, we found that to be sort of an extension of what we already have in terms of the ethical uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. Now beyond that, the, the, the fund is getting greener by its own dynamics because they are, as professional investors, uh, looking at opportunities um, out there and they're also um, um, engaging uh, more and more in corporate governance and trying to influence companies. Uh, at, in the early days it was more about divesting, now it's about, about uh, corporate governance and trying to promote sounder policies on the part of companies. They were part of the drive in Exxon for carbon disclosure, for example, mm -hmm. or carbon risk disclosure. Mm -hmm. um, I want to allow the audience to ask you some questions as well, but one, one other thing that I think is, was notable is sort of the role that Norway has taken in international climate and forestry initiatives and, and the leadership role that you've played there. Maybe talk a little bit about what, what that is, but also wh how do you connect that to Norway's uh, uh, national interest? Well, we're essentially seeing that the, uh, the forests um, and peatlands and uh, land use around the world um, is about, represents about up to a third of the solution to climate change or to the response to climate change. Um, which essentially means that if you want to have anything near achieving the Paris targets, you need to protect the world's forests. And you need to ensure that uh, not only protection, but that also production from those forests is sustainable. So uh, Norway's most important climate policy is actually uh, our investment in supporting countries to more sustainably manage their forests. We're setting aside about three billion Norwegian kroner per year uh, for that purpose. It's been extremely successful in Brazil. It's uh, uh, very promising now in Indonesia. It's far more complicated in the DRC, as you can imagine. Uh, I'm going to Colombia and Peru uh, from here, actually, uh, okay. where we're seeing very promising uh, initiatives. Absolutely. Uh, and it's simply, there's a carbon sink there without which the Paris Agreement will be doomed. So mm -hmm. we, we just need to make that a priority. And of course, it does have other effects, talking about food security, talking about biodiversity, indigenous rights, etc. Mm -hmm. um, the starting point, point was climate change, but we're seeing uh, an array of benefits from upholding and protecting forests. Mm -hmm. 
So not to put you on the spot, but you are in Washington, and we have made a decision here to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Is there, uh, is there anything that you think Americans and the folks that are thinking about this issue should, should understand about how Norway is conceived of this as being in, uh, in your national interest that we can learn from? Well, I think it's up to uh, the American public and American actors uh, in business and uh, cities and states and uh, NGOs to uh, have that discussion on what is in, in uh, the interest of the US. Uh, I'm observing that there is a groundswell now of responses to that decision in the US. We're ready to support that. We're ready to work with individual US states. Uh, we're already working with US businesses, including in the forestry, uh, mm -hmm. the rainforest initiative. Um, and we're uh, ready to do more in that uh, domain. Um, and I would like to say that we're, we hope that we can still have good climate policy discussions with the administration. Well, that's Correct. why I'm in Washington today. I would like to, to see that happen. I would like to learn more about what the thinking is about the next steps, and I would like to think and hope that we can work together on um, sensible uh, climate policies um, and, of course, underline that at any time we would welcome the U.S. back to the table. Great. Actually, you're going to be at the table for some years more. <laughs> yeah. the, the technicality <laughs> of it is we will be probably in the room at least, right? Okay, well, I'm going to open it up to the audience. Please uh, wait for a mic, state your name and affiliation, and question in the form of a question, and very pleased to take any uh, of your comments or questions. Got right here in the aisle, and then right here, and then right there. Okay, now we've got. Hi, uh, Chris Knight with Argus Media. Um, President Trump, when he withdrew, said he wanted to renegotiate the climate deal, get a better deal. Is you said you want to have climate discussions going forward? Are you open to uh, kind of reopening Paris, trying to find a way to, to you know? satisfy Trump? <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, th there is no rationale for renegotiating because the Paris Agreement uh, is based on voluntary commitments, essentially, from countries and an ambition. We have the two-degree target and the 1.5-degree aspirational goal. Uh, and beyond that, we have an ambition mechanism that every five years will reconsider and, uh, and enhance ambitions. Norway was chairing the working group on the ambition mechanism, so there's no way we want to renegotiate <laughs> that one. We'd like to see negotiations every five years on, or consultations every five years on how we can enhance uh, ambitions. But it's very hard to see um, any logic behind renegotiating. Now, my reading is that the US could reduce its own uh, NDC without necessarily violating the agreement and exposing itself to legal action. I wouldn't say that would be sensible, but it's, uh, I think it's possible. Uh, but renegotiation is not on the table. Right there. My name is Bjorn Homse from uh, the World Bank. Uh, there's just a new climate report out here a couple of days ago uh, um, with, uh, from a commission headed by uh, economists Stieglitz and Stern, and they say that uh, you likely would need a carbon tax in the range of 40 to 80 dollars per ton in 2020, and maybe the range 50 to 100 by 2030. Now, that's uh, ambitious to, to get agreement on, but could you see Norway not only comply with uh, that kind of, of levels of CO2 uh, taxation, but could you see Norway actually take a lead on that topic as an oil producer? Hmm. Did you say that that was an initiative for a global um, level? Well, tax? yeah, it w would have to be as global as you could make it, I suppose. I mean, we would, we would like to see a global tax on carbon, but we... We don't hold that to be particularly realistic, um, but we are. Um, we have a, a carbon tax uh, in that range. I guess it is about eighty uh, dollars um, per ton. We and we see the carbon tax as the, the main climate policy tool we have uh, domestically. It's not the only one. And, uh, 
there are voluntary agreements, there are, there's legislation, there are other things we can do. But uh, the carbon tax is uh, a basis. Uh, and we, uh, we've been working with the um, Chinese, our, our um, EPA has been working with the Chinese over the last few years, uh, advising on um, a carbon market, which um, will now roll out nationally uh, this year. Um, so I think we would, in the absence of an international agreement or any likelihood of a global carbon tax, we would like to be supportive of any national, regional, subnational initiative in this domain. Uh, we're going to go right behind you, Helen, first, and then it'll come to you. Hi, Hannah McKinnon with Oil Change International. You talked a lot about the demand side of the equation, and obviously we've all seen pretty impressive leadership from Norway there. There is the other side of the equation, supply side. You mentioned the tensions that you feel as a large northern exporter. Is there space for Norway to show more leadership on the supply side? Is there appetite in the country for conversations around managed decline as we move towards decarbonization? Well, we, um, we do take the, as a starting point that uh, as long as there is demand for oil, uh, there, is no, there is little reason why we, as a country with fairly strict environmental controls and high taxes, plus being part of the European uh, emissions trading market, uh, that we should be the first to uh, reduce production if production would move elsewhere. Uh, but where I do see a discussion on its way is on um, the longer term, I mean, the profitability of um, investments with a 30, 40 year horizon. Mm. Um, given that we know that um, climate policies will be tougher, the ambition mechanism of the Paris Agreement is one example of that. Uh, given the uncertainties on the demand side. Uh, there is a discussion um, that we have started in Norwegian politics on, we have a, a tax incentive system for exploration that the state then generously gets back when, when uh, extraction starts. Uh, there is a, a beginning discussion on whether that regime is sensible given uncertainties uh, decades into the future. But um, uh, it's not a discussion that is anywhere near uh, conclusion. So, uh, but but it's it's an it's an emerging discussion, I would say. Ellen. Thanks very much, and thank you for the the incredible leadership Norway shows, both domestically and with tropical forest countries. Um, my question is really linked to the Green Competitiveness Commission. One of the frustrating things for many of us in the uh, last few weeks here in the U.S. is that there's been a lot of misinformation circulating, either poor analyses or outdated analyses or misunderstandings of those analyses about the economic costs of climate action, suggesting that the Paris Agreement would be expensive for the U.S. when, in fact, what we're seeing in states and in businesses is that it would be economically beneficial. And we see that internationally in Norway and elsewhere as well. Um, so one of the questions I have is, with the Green Competitiveness Commission, did you find that as a tool also something which helped to bring the different sectors and the population along and understanding the new economic opportunities as well as the security benefits? And were there any positive surprises? You mentioned some of the challenges, but positive surprises from the work. Uh, yeah, I think uh, security was not a part of the equation, but um, the economic opportunities were uh, clearly um, at the center of attention. And what was remarkable was that this wasn't only businesses and business federations, but researchers and also um, trade unions joining in these efforts. Um, one very encouraging, encouraging report uh, was the one coming from uh, transportation, which is a, a broad sector, but essentially all main players in transportation in Norway said uh, we will be able, it's realistic to achieve 50% emission reductions 
in transportation by 2030. And then um, going from there to zero emissions by 2050. Um, and looking at uh, technology, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, but our estimates from the side of the government is that yes, it might very well be doable. Um, and the fact that the those who are actually driving those trucks <laughs> agree with us is or have, have taken the lead is very encouraging. Uh, we've seen um, similar moves from uh, um, several uh, other sectors where they've taken sort of a hard look at themselves. Um, one, and I'm, I'm related of course to uh, to transportation, consumer goods companies uh, and consumer goods, the consumer goods sector has looked at uh, how they're using transport uh, and how what their environmental footprint, footprint and climate footprint is like, uh, putting up a very ambitious uh, pathway, including on food waste and a, a range of issues that have come into play. So it's been a reflection process and the fact that it's been a huge partnership has led to uh, a level of maturity in so many circles around this, which has had another important uh, effect, I think, um, because there is a lot of anxiety. I mean, the trade unions are calling for a just transition. I mean, they're mm -hmm. seeing that some businesses will go down the drain and they need to uh, reassure uh, people that this will uh, be compensated by new jobs and new opportunities. Mm. Um, and having those discussions in an inclusive way has contributed, I think, to um, at least preparing the ground for uh, better discussion. And I'm very mindful of reactions that you see in the US, that you've seen across Europe, of, uh, against globalization and against technological change. And that's a big part of the climate change agenda. If we are to solve climate change, we need that technological change. We need it to accelerate. Uh, and. Uh, it may create a, create a lot of anxieties um, among people and households, and we need to manage that, and we need to therefore have that dialogue. Do you think that do you think the just transition conversation within Norway is 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 advanced? I mean, is it a is it something? Because I can see a lot of Norwegian industry looking at the leadership role that Norway plays on sort of the transition to a greener economy and, and questions whether or not you know, it, will, it will mean transition risk for them. And is that something you've spent a lot of time on? I, I would say here in the US, we, we don't think about it as well as we should. It's always sort of, we're, we try to e excite people about the opportunity and we sort of uh, somewhere down the line get to the issue about what you do with the transition risk. And I, and I think we've not done as good a job with that as we should. No, I think we, we also uh, have a long way to go. Uh, I can mention one example. I have, a, as a climate minister, I have a climate council where business federations, trade unions, NGOs, researchers, businesses are gathered around the table and we address sector issues and sector uh, and, and cross sectoral issues. And we're about to, to launch a white paper on climate policy uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and discussing that white paper with my climate council, the trade unions came up with a very clear call, consistent. Mm -hmm. Can you please write that white paper in a simple and understandable way? Because climate policy is impossible to <laughs> grasp for our members. They get anxious. So my, my um, instruction to uh, my civil servants was to uh, try to write this as if you're telling a story to your kid or as if you're writing a letter to a kid. Uh, and let's see if we can meet somewhere in the, mid <laughs> in the middle road to try to um, be as educational as we can because I mean, even my ministerial colleagues are complaining that it's completely impossible to understand the different dynamics of, of climate policy. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's a very important issue uh, down to that level of how do we communicate what climate policy is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a major issue mm -hmm. probably in the US as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yes, please, ma'am. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Sarah Flores. I'm from the National Science Foundation. Um, I know you mentioned that something that Norway is actively working on is decreasing demand um, for oil and um, related energies. So you mentioned a couple of strategies, one of which was electrifying the transportation sector. You also touched on linking with related issues. So um, what other strategies have worked in Norway um, that you can specifically point to? Thank you. Well, transportation is the biggest because if you look globally, transport is the biggest taker of oil. And therefore, by demonstrating that electrifying the vehicle fleet is possible, we're setting an example. Obviously, there will be less demand for oil from the Norwegian transportation market, but that's not a, it's not a big one in the international <laughs> scene. Um, then we're a hydropowered nation. I didn't mention that. But hydropower is the source of almost all electricity or heating in Norway, which means that in the building sector we have, we don't have that much to, uh, that much emissions to cut. That said, we do have oil heaters in certain homes and certain um, um, yeah, like hospitals, the military businesses, and we are about to introduce a full ban on oil heaters. Uh, it's I'm tabling it very shortly, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and it will be introduced by uh, or effective from 2020 to give people a, a period of transition. Mm -hmm. And that's a real cost for people. There, there will be some incentive schemes to, to make it happen, but, uh, but still, it's a real cost. Minister Helgeson, I know you've got some meetings to get to, and so I just want to say thank you very much for spending your time here today. and. Uh, uh, we appreciate all of the thoughts that you've shared with us, and we hope that you have a, a good visit to Washington. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.